if we go back about 80 million years ago, if we were standing here, we would be in a deeper portion of the inland Cretaceous Sea. And at that time, there are single-celled algae that are, that are settling to the sea floor. And those algae consist of these little platelets comprised of calcium carbonate, they're called coccoliths. And over millions of years, those little platelets of calcium carbonate accumulated. Calcium carbonate is white, which is why those rocks you see in the background, the chalk, which is the Smoky Hill member of the Niobrara Formation, uh, is white. So then that begs the question, well, why do we see these badlands? We're on the edge of an escarpment along the Smoky Hill River. And on this escarpment, up on the high plain surface, there's a fairly thick veneer of lus, which is aeolian. Beneath that is the Ogallala Formation, which is comprised of sands and gravels. And beneath that is the uh, Niobrara Formation. Well, along this escarpment, what's happened is the lus has been stripped off. The Ogallala Formation, which armored the Niobrara Formation, has also eroded away. And it's exposed the Niobrara chalks. Now, the lower portion and middle portions of the Niobrara chalks are, are very soft and highly erodible. In the upper part of the section, the carbonates have actually cemented and created a more resistant surface. And so what we have is a process referred to as differential erosion, where you have these patches of heavily cemented Niobrara chalk that forms a cap rock. Much like the, in the Ogallala Formation, you have a cap rock that's cemented by calcium carbonate. The same thing occurs with the Niobrara. So consequently, you get these spires that are capped by this heavily cemented calcium carbonate and the softer Niobrara chalk below it, which is why we refer to it as differential erosion. So again, if we go back 80 million years ago, what was swimming around here? Based on the fossil record, which is pretty well preserved in the Niobrara, there were some very large swimming reptiles, most notably the Mosasaur, which is anywhere from about 30 to 60 feet in length. There are plesiosaurs, which are long-necked dinosaurs that swam around. There were very large sharks, much like the great white shark. And there were also quite a few invertebrates. So a much different assemblage of animals existed there back 80 million years ago than exists in our oceans today. Little Jerusalem Badlands State Park is a joint effort between the Nature Conservancy and Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism. You know, the main reason the Nature Conservancy purchased Little Jerusalem Badlands State Park was to preserve the natural resource and also to, to let people experience some of that natural resource. We've had visitors from, from all over the world, literally, and people traveling down I-70 that would normally not take a detour south uh, are doing that now to see Little Jerusalem. It's really become famous. The park opened October 12th of last year. Opening day, I believe we had 630 people visit. We average probably close to 2,000 people a month. So that's important because that brings people to those local towns and, uh, and brings economic development there. We basically did all the infrastructure building ourselves. We have two trails. The Overlook Trail is 1,200 feet. The Life on the Rocks Trail is about 3,700 feet. Along both trails, there's info signs detailing the flora and the fauna that you'll find at Little Jerusalem Badlands State Park. We were creating trails and bridges around the park to give visitors good access, but keep them and the park safe so it was sustainable, so they weren't degrading the park while they were using it. We do take tours uh, down in and among the geological structures, but those are organized tours. Those aren't people getting to go down there on their own. We want people to be safe first and foremost, but we also want to respect and conserve the beautiful structures that are there. And while you think, well, heck, these have been exposed to the elements, these must be tough. They actually aren't, they're pretty fragile and they can be degraded by humans just like they have been by wind and water over time. And so we reserve tours down into the heart of Little Jerusalem to be guided. But then of course, people can come and be out on the periphery to see the beautiful overlook and vistas, you know, anytime they want. Um, but we're careful about getting people down inside. If we were to cross over the Smoky Hill River on the opposite, the north side of it, is the Smoky Hill Ranch. And one of the most 
important archaeological sites in North America is located there. It's called the 12 Mile Creek site. In 1895, Samuel Williston, who was on the faculty at the University of Kansas, he sent out two of his assistants, H.T. Martin and T.R. Overton, to come out here and look for fossils. And in their search, they came across on the opposite side at the foot of, a, of an area much like this, uh, the remains of bison, which had been driven off a uh, cliff. And so it was a bison kill. And amongst the bison remains, they found a projectile point within the skeletons. And based on diagrams and a rather grainy photo, it looks like a Folsom projectile point. Now, the reason I say this is really significant is that it really wasn't until 1927 that the Folsom site was discovered in Folsom, in the area of Folsom, New Mexico. And the Folsom site is famous for being the first evidence of people with extinct Pleistocene animals, in other words, Ice Age animals. Well, the bison at the 12 Mile Creek site are extinct forms. They're bison occidentalis. They're about a third larger than the modern bison, have a much uh, larger um, span of horns. And so that predates Folsom by more than 30 years, that discovery. So it's, a, it's an interesting area in terms of its archeology span and also in terms of its geology, and certainly in terms of the animal remains that date to the Cretaceous period. Cedar Bluff functions differently from Little Jerusalem. We've been averaging just under 200,000, but we believe our attendance in 2020 will be uh, uh, at or above 220,000 visitors. Started construction in 1949, finished up in the 50s, and then started filling up in 1951. Cedar Bluff is a Bureau of Reclamation reservoir uh, with flood control that's operated by the Corps of Engineers. And so, as most of our federal reservoirs, really all of our federal reservoirs in Kansas, the primary purpose is, is flood control. But as the majority of our Bureau of Reclamation reservoirs, which are in the western half of the state, the other primary purpose was for irrigation. And so it was authorized under the Pick Sloan Act, or the Flood Control Act of 1944 was its other name. And what that did was essentially split things east and west. And that's not only the case in Kansas, but it all up and down um, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, uh, Montana. And so anything west of the 98th Meridian is supposed to be done by the Bureau of Reclamation. Anything east is supposed to be done by the Corps of Engineers. Cedar Bluff was put into that plan uh, under the Bureau of Reclamation's auspices as being an irrigation and the flood control reservoir. It's a unique lake for a number of reasons. It's a Bureau of Reclamation reservoir, so it has more fluctuation uh, in terms of water level than most of our reservoirs. And so sedimentation, I'm not going to say it's not an issue at all, but it's a very, very small issue at Cedar Bluff. Our issue is there's no water coming into the reservoir. And so we've got to be very protective of that. Cedar Bluff has a really large flood control pool. Again, it was built in 50-51, and, and that was a time where the 40s were pretty wet, and then of course we had the 51 flood. And so the Regional Advisory Committee would, would like for us to look at if there is a time when we get water into the flood pool, that we hold on to that water. From a water plan standpoint, you know, it's how do we look at the recreation there? That's the primary purpose. And then, you know, if you look at related issues, water supply in general in the Smoky Hill region is an issue. And so depending on, on how things shake out with some of the water supplies for Hayes and Russell, you know, will they be relying on their, their Shinshin and Pfeiffer well fields as much in the future? And if they are not relying on those as much in the future, then do we need to be looking at, at the management of the artificial recharge pool and those others to support their alluvial well fields? Again, that's that's kind of an issue for down the road because there's a lot of moving parts on, on the water supply between now and then. We've been fortunate. The water level has come up and stayed up pretty well. So we've had incredible water clarities. Earlier this spring, we had a clarity over 30 feet, which is amazing for Kansas, really unheard of here. Now, the downside of that is that means it's not really productive. There's not a lot of algae and zooplankton, which fish need. So there's a downside from a fishery management perspective, but in terms of recreational users, boaters, swimmers, um, skiers, they've been crazy about that place. And we've had tremendously high use this year. We work hard to maintain access areas onto the lake, but also around the lake. There's miles and miles of roadway. And of course, we're very interested in the work that KDOT is doing on the dam to refurbish that, make that 
a safe passageway because there aren't a lot of big main roads in that part of the state. And that road across the dam is especially important to all of us uh, who are using Cedar Bluff Reservoir. Construction started in 1949 and uh, finished kind of the latter part of 1951. And the reason this dam and reservoir was built, kind of actually, you have to rewind to the decade of the 1930s. Of course, that's when the Midwest part of the nation had extreme drought. Coming out of that, the nation was very interested in trying to find means for like soil conservation, ways to control flooding and also provide water for irrigation. And so what Kansas had actually done was kind of petition and ask the Bureau of Reclamation to do some investigation within the Smoky Hill River Basin to see if there was a feasible area to create storage of water for those ideas. For here, uh, what that was, even though there's a number of cities downstream up here like Ellis, Hayes, Victoria, Dorrance, Russell, they were very interested back then in what the Bureau of Reclamation would find because their own domestic wells for house use was starting to get taxed and so they were pretty interested in seeing if a reservoir could be built to help supplement their water use for domestic uses. The original design was called a steel arch tide bridge and so the previous bridge went up and over the road and so you drove through it essentially and now you see the more traditional style of bridge that we would build now with steel beams underneath it and just a concrete deck. Here in western Kansas for example we have a lot of weather extremes wintertime, for example, a lot of freeze-thaw cycles. And with it being made out of concrete, steel, the addition of salt to there, that's just a very corrosive nature. And so, you know, that one behind us lives 68 years, and it just got to the point to where uh, repair actions were no longer feasible, so we did have to take it down. For Cedar Bluff, they're blessed with really nice park areas, both on the North Shore and the South Shore. Great camping, there's cabins on both sides. So kind of the, the time frame of when we needed to close this thing fell in a very inopportune time. It, it was June of last year, right in the middle of camping season, boating season, recreational season, but it, it had to be closed for safety purposes. So we realized the importance of that. So we moved this job to the very front of the line. And as of taping, this we're here at the end of July, we're about two weeks away from getting this thing open.